Hello, everyone. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. My name is Veronica Guadagni, and I'm the Director of Sleep Science here at Cerebra. Cerebra is a Canadian technology company transforming the future of sleep diagnosis and therapy. Cerebra unites innovators and researchers with a common goal and passion of putting the sleep back into sleep medicine. And this is why we put together the Catching Up on Sleep webinar series where we bring to, to you hot topics in sleep presented by researchers on the cutting edge of sleep science that refuse to hit the snooze button. And Dr. Walsh is an example of this. I would like to start with some housekeeping. So um, through the presentation, you will be able to use the Q&A function and you can input your questions there. You can also use the chat, but uh, the Q&A function, it's easier to manage, so please use that. We value your feedback, so please fill out the anonymous evaluation form, which I will provide in the chat um, during the presentation. And uh, this talk is eligible for continuing education credits. So you will need to complete the survey and then we will send you the certificate of completion at the end of the evaluation. As always, if you have troubles with that, please feel free to contact either directly me or the, the team so we can help with receiving the, the certificate. And our speaker for today is Dr. Olivia Walsh. She's an adjunct investigator in the Department of Neurology at the University of Michigan, and she's the CEO of Arcascope, a circadian rhythm software startup. Her research focuses on using phones and wearables to track and steer sleep and circadian rhythms under real-world conditions. In addition to their consumer mobile apps, which have been downloaded more than a half a million times, her team maintains a number of open source libraries for sleep and circadian analysis. So without further ado, I um, will stop sharing my screen and let Dr. Walsh um, share hers. Awesome, thank you so much. Let me click the share screen button. All right, can you see my screen? And I can't yeah. see you, all right, great. Um, hey everybody, thanks for coming out to my talk today. Uh, I'm gonna talk both about mechanistic models and what I mean by that and machine learning models and what I mean by that in a sort of hybrid approach. This is also sort of a hybrid presentation. So I'm gonna talk about two pretty different areas of my research. Um, you already heard this, but uh, I do have a conflict of interest. I'm a CEO, the, the biggest conflict of all, um, in addition to being in the Department of Neurology at the University of Michigan. Uh, and in this talk, I'm gonna tell you about statistical models for sleep-wake detection mechanistic models for circadian rhythms tracking and how I think they could play nicely together in the future, um, including how they're playing nicely together already. But first, what do I mean when I talk about models? Um, I, I, in my mind, think of a model as something that converts less interesting inputs into more interesting outputs. So for instance, of raw acceleration, motion information. It's a lot, it's like maybe a hundred megabytes. Uh, it's just not very interesting looking at a bunch of numbers, but if I can convert that into more interesting sleep-wake probabilities or the times when I think you were literally asleep or awake, ah, there's more to do. Uh, another way of saying this, um, or another example is a mechanistic model. So a mechanistic model that converts a, a less interesting history of somebody's light exposure into a more interesting timing of their dim light melatonin onset, this key circadian biomarker your body wants to produce melatonin once per day, when is it gonna do it? Um, but you can, you can reframe everything I just said here by replacing interesting with actionable. Raw data is very limited in its actionability. You can't really do much with a list of numbers by itself, but models can make it tractable. They can make it something you can work with. Uh, and so a statistical model in theory might look something like this. I think I, I Googled neural net and took the first Google images result here. Um, a mechanistic model in theory probably looks something like this. It's a bunch of equations where you're like, okay, uh, something's going on here. I'm not sure what, but clearly something. Um, and just to kind of 
start diving into the, the statistical side. Okay, like I would say the definition of a statistical model for me is that you've got a training set and a testing set and they they should be different. You don't wanna train on data and then test on that data because it's kind of like knowing the answers to the test. Um, ooh, and I see something just came in on the chat. Um, oh, the survey, great. Okay, so you've got training and testing set. Um, you live or die by the quality of your training data. So it better be good, garbage in, garbage out. They don't really yield insight into what's driving things biologically, though they can. So a statistical model is more like, hey, we've seen this before, here's what we think this is, but it's not gonna tell you what proteins are involved in this or the mechanism behind it. Um, and then the last bullet point here is going to conquer the world every day. Uh, I mean, everything you hear about with AI, I consider those statistical models these days. So chat GPT is, is picking the next word it shows you probabilistically, um, like everything with like image processing. It's really leveraging just huge swarms of data. And, and there've been many times where I, like John Henry, have been like, oh no, I'm, I'm gonna use human cleverness to defeat uh, the awesome power of uh, gigabytes and gigabytes and terabytes of data, and I always lose. Um, but not all statistical models need to be that complicated. So if you've ever heard of Cole Kripke, like the classic actigraphy uh, algorithm that your ActoWatch would be using to distinguish sleep versus wake, it's a statistical model. And literally what they do is they, they've got the activity counts in each chunk of time. So uh, four minutes ago, three minutes ago, two minutes ago, going out to two minutes in the future, they multiply them by numbers, and then they they multiply by a little number uh, in the front, and then they just apply a thresholding rule. And above that, you're awake, and below it, you're asleep. And they arrived at this, um, well, I think, just by by figuring out what worked by like looking at their training data. Um, so this is very simple. This has way fewer numbers in it. It's got what functionally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers than a deep neural net, which has maybe 70 billion numbers. Uh, but like, what does a deep neural net or a neural net actually look like in practice? I, I mean, under the hood, there's lots of stuff going on, but often when you're using it, it looks something like this. So this is a sample of my code uh, for tracking sleep from activity. Uh, literally, all I do to train my model is call classifier.fit there on, on line four um, with my training data. And then suddenly I've got a trained model. There's lots of tools you can use. You don't have to, to uh, invent the wheel to, to be able to use statistical models. Uh, and so I'm gonna tell you now about how I've used statistical models to classify sleep versus wake from acceleration and heart rate using data that we collected from an Apple Watch in both healthy individuals and people with sleep disorders. Uh, so a fun fact is that it's possible to extract raw acceleration data from an Apple Watch. Um, looks something like this. You gotta write your own code to do it, but if you do that, you can get really dense, juicy, beautiful data. Um, the units here are in G and there's three lines because an Apple Watch is gonna have three directions, X, Y, Z, that it's measuring acceleration in. Um, and so with this, you can create activity counts, which are like pixelated acceleration. It's like the, the coarse representation of it. And then you can train a model. You can train a sleep weight classifier that's going to go epic by epic, chunk of time by ch chunk of time and say, oh, this is sleep, but this is wake. Um, and if you have a, a statistical sleep model, you can ask, how good is it? How, how accurate is it? But more important than accuracy, because if you say a night of sleep is 100% sleep, you'll often be 90-ish percent accurate. Um, like how good is it at wake and sleep? So, so what is the specificity and sensitivity is often a question you ask about a statistical sleep model. What about sleep staging? What if you try a different type of classifier? So you could try something really simple, like a logistic regression model, or you could try something really fancy, like a deep convolutional neural net. Um, you can also say, hey, what features matter? Like, do I need heart rate? Um, or is activity just okay? What, what matters? Uh, so you can ask these questions of a statistical sleep model, um, which is what I, I started in 2017. So we collected raw acceleration, up there on the top plot, and then we converted it to activity counts to be backwards compatible. We also got heart rate from the Apple Watch, and then we got gold standard polysomnography there at the bottom in the green. This is all online. The code and data are open source. 
One additional thing we did here is that I used the kind of modeling I'm going to talk about in the next section to add a prediction for what the circadian clock was doing over the course of the night. Don't worry about that for now. We're just going to look at the, the raw data, and I want to teach you very briefly about ROC curves. So this is what it might look like if I, if I sort of processed the activity counts over the night. You can see they're higher at the beginning, that blue curve, and then they get lower, and then there's maybe a spike later, and then the red shows the sleep-wake classification I would get if I made one my threshold for awake. So it's awake, and then it thinks you're asleep, and then it's awake again, and it thinks you're asleep again. And then there's just like a little wake burst in the, the middle of the night. Um, but you can change the threshold. And when you change the threshold, uh, you're going to get a different specificity and sensitivity. You're going to change your sleep accuracy and your wake accuracy. And ROC curve summarizes all possible choices of thresholds. So you move the threshold from the very bottom to the very top, and you plot the sleep accuracy or the sensitivity that's how much of the real sleep you got right against one minus the wake accuracy um, or the specificity. So that's how much of the real wake you got wrong. And you want uh, these charts, these ROC curves to look like stair steps because that means you can pick a point with a really high true positive rate, the fraction of sleep that you said was sleep, that's in the upper left corner, while also having a, a really low false positive rate. So you want high true positive rate, low false positive rate. It makes it look like a stair step. A way to remember it is diagonal line ROC curve, very bad, stair step, pretty good. Um, so one of the findings we, we've had in 2017 uh, through 2019 really didn't matter what classifier we used with activity counts. They were all basically the same. Heart rate really didn't help. Um, it was critical for trying to do anything with staging and activity counts, um, but it didn't help us differentiate sleep from wake, probably because it was so correlated with uh, motion. So the story motion was telling us wasn't that different from the story heart rate was telling us. And granted, this was heart rate in beats per minute, so I wasn't using heart rate variability or anything like that. Um, and then the last thing is just this proxy feature I mentioned for circadian drive um, did actually improve performance um, quite a bit. Again, don't think about that too hard right now. We're going to come back to that. Um, so, okay, so this is interesting, but there's more questions you can ask of a statistical sleep model. You can say, hey, if I train on healthy people and then I try and score the sleep of somebody with apnea, how will it do? Or what if I train and test only on people with sleep disorders? And a reason you might care about this is that if your classifier performance is worse in people with disordered sleep, we need to know how much worse if we're using classifiers for clinical care. Um, so this is work from a couple of years ago. It's got a pizza because it hasn't been published yet. So it's a uh, hot and spicy, maybe not so hot and spicy now that's almost the end of 2023. We collected data from people who were referred by a clinician for polysomnography screening for OSA or narcolepsy. Um, same exact way as we collected the data in the prior study, um, except it was much faster because we just we had them slap on an Apple Watch when they came in to do their PSG. And we ended up with 34 people who had mostly OSA and then a few people with narcolepsy. And there's this data over here on the right. You can see this person, uh, like they just have much more motion during the night than our, our prior person's data. So that, that purple plot in the upper right corner, it's got a lot more going on. It suggests disordered sleep. Okay, so just using motion data, specifically activity counts we made from that motion data, uh, let's make an ROC curve using a random forest model. So motion data only. What we end up getting, if I just sort of plop a point on here, is a if you fix the sleep accuracy at 90%, you say, okay, I wanna choose a threshold that gets me a sleep accuracy of 90%. Um, what you end up with is a, a wake accuracy of about 44%. Um, so that's actually pretty, pretty typical of like actigraphy, um, classical actigraphy. What if you just use heart rate? So Apple Watch heart rate, not very good. This looks more like that diagonal line that I said was basically random. And indeed, the, the sort of fixed sleep accuracy and wake accuracy, like if you say fixing it at 90% sleep accuracy, drawing this horizontal line at 90% and then projecting down to see what my wake accuracy is, it ends up being not the best, like 22% uh, wake accuracy. And then if you combine motion and heart rate, so we're training on healthy sleepers and we're testing on people with a sleep disorder, 
Um, uh, it's basically the same as if you had no heart rate at all. So heart rate, again, really isn't helping us out here. Heart rate is not making it so that we're able to do better um, for, for classifying sleep in this population. And it really doesn't matter what model I use. It's, it's kind of the same story. Heart rate by itself is the worst. And it doesn't really help us distinguish sleep versus wake um, over motion. Uh, and by the way, if you, if you flash back to the first slides I showed and you train on healthy sleepers and test on healthy sleepers, it's actually a lot better. It's about 10% better. So if we, if we have a healthy pool and we test on healthy sleepers, our wake accuracy, when we fix our sleep accuracy at 90% is like 54%. So I think a natural question to ask here is, Hey, if we train only using people with apnea and then we test on people with apnea, do we do better? And the answer is a little bit. So now we're training on people with apnea. We're making an apnea specific statistical model and we're testing on people with apnea. And okay, it's about 6% better. Our wake accuracy was previously 44%. Now it's 50%. Um, so I think that's, that's bad. It's at least an improvement. It's not a huge improvement, but it makes it closer to parity with healthy people um, being evaluated using a model that was trained with non-disordered sleepers. So takeaways, uh, when you evaluate a classifier trained on healthy people using data from people with sleep disorders, mostly OSA, performance drops by about 10%. So the, the wake accuracy is about 10% worse, um, but you're able to rescue it partially by making a uh, disordered sleepers model, uh, people with apnea model. And so other questions you might ask here, Okay, well, how much does OSA severity matter? Could you actually get some information out of heart rate? Um, how wrong are actual sleep metrics, um, like total sleep time, sleep efficiency, as opposed to just wake accuracy, which is just one way of looking at how good the sleep classifier is. And these are not questions I'm gonna answer here, but they're totally questions that you can answer with a statistical model. But now I wanna change tax. I wanna talk about mechanistic models. And here's what I mean by a mechanistic model. So it's all about the biology. I'm really trying to, to represent biology with math, with equations. And you don't even need data to make one. Like a statistical model, if you don't have data, good luck. But mechanistic models, you can literally just like sit in a room and be like, okay, if this molecule hits this molecule and they bind at this rate, what's gonna happen? So they can kind of exist in, in an abstract void. They're shaped and built right now more by human decisions than, than by data a lot of the time, though data usually has some role. Um, otherwise, it's, if it's totally disconnected from data, it's not very useful. Um, and then I think there's this kind of feeling, at least in like my corner of the world, that is this all going to be outperformed by statistical models someday? Like, is massive, massive data just going to kind of make this moot? Or are we going to going to just like end up not building these models uh, by hand, having the AI build them? Uh, as an example of what one of these looks like, here's that one I showed you before. This is a mechanistic model of the human circadian clock. Um, if you've looked at this and you're just like, ah, oh, of course, that's really weird. Cause I don't think anyone should understand this without spending like maybe a couple months playing with it, simulating it, really understanding what's going on here. It's kind of like, like a tent that's still in its bag. Like you, until you actually unpack it and, and set everything up and explore the space, I, this should look like nonsense because uh, it it really isn't interpretable in this format, but I want to give you an intuition for what a mechanistic model is trying to get at. Um, so here's a mechanistic model developed by a guy named Kevin Hene, and it, it sort of starts with first principles. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is in your brain. It's it's your body's uh, central pacemaker, the, the clock that's in your head, and it's made of about 20,000 coupled neurons you can represent every single one of those neurons with its own equation. And this is it. And basically this, this equation is saying in words, hey, these neurons are talking to each other. They're talking to each other and they're trying to synchronize. And if a neuron sees that one of its neighbors is a little bit ahead of it, it's gonna try and hurry up and catch up. And if it sees it's a little bit behind, it's going to try and slow down so the other one can catch up. But it's going to do this by talking to all of its neighbors. And sometimes it, it has neighbors it listens to less, and sometimes it has neighbors it listens to more. And this is the way the real SCN works. And so you can 
encode that information in an equation. Uh, of course, when you actually put it in practice, it looks something like this. There really aren't any pre-built packages you can use for this. You're usually just building one of these mechanistic models yourself. Um, so there's, there's not uh, out of the box solutions for this, um, but you can use these to track circadian rhythms in the real world. Um, so your body's internal clock, similar to sleep, but not the same thing. And you might say, okay, why would I need to do this in the first place? Why is tracking circadian rhythms hard? Well, I think the biggest reason tracking circadian rhythms is hard is something called masking. Okay, so your body's circadian clock has tons and tons of rhythms. Uh, they all are about one day in duration, though it's, it's sort of flexible. Nothing is exactly 24 hours in biology. Um, why can't you just measure one of those? And the problem is, yeah, the circadian clock affects a lot of these things, but so do plenty of other things as well. So example, imagine I'm measuring your temperature and I'm trying to, to watch the circadian rhythm in your temperature. And then you get up and you move around well, it's going to heat up your body. And so the circadian signal is going to be masked by the motion. And I can't just look at your, your signal and be like, oh, for sure. I know their minimum temperature is this time because I don't know what it's hidden behind. I don't know what's masking it. And here's a, another example of, of masking. Um, here's some data. It's fake activity data. And so you can see there's a sort of like a square uh, wave that that's the uh, the activity for this person, it goes up and it comes down again. And then there's a green dashed line, which is a cosine fit. And so you might say, Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fit this data. It's, it's circadian. It's a rhythm. Cosines are a rhythm. Let me fit it to a cosine, uh, something that goes up and down. Um, and that fit, it looks like it's tracking with the data. Um, uh, it's going up at some points that make sense and down at other points that make sense. And then I add a single outlier. And granted, this is a big outlier, but it's it's not outside of the realm of possible when you're looking at real world data. And this red line, this red curve down there is the best cosine fit to this, this data. Um, and it's awful. It, it's actually inverted. With a single outlier being introduced, you can totally mess up the, the cosine fit uh, of this data, which is why I really don't think you want to use cosines to to track circadian rhythms. They, they're just gonna constantly be subject to the sabotage by outliers. So how do we in the circadian field avoid masking? Okay, well, one thing we do is constant routine. And the short version of constant routine is you stay as constant as possible. So you're in constant lighting, constant position. You're not allowed to sleep in a long block because sleep can be masking. So you may be sleeping in short blocks uh, around the clock. Uh, and constant routine has been critical for the circadian rhythms field. It's unveiled circadian rhythms and hormones and glucose metabolisms, all these rhythms we would never have been able to track in the real world because we wouldn't have known whether or not we were seeing something circadian or just behavioral. Uh, the problem though, is that this is not practical in the real world um, at all. Like you cannot bring somebody in at scale and have constant routine be done. It's time consuming. It's miserable. Uh, and also like, it's, it's unnatural, like sleep loss. You're going to accrue a lot of that. If you're only allowed to sleep in short bursts around the clock, um, that can be a masking factor. The fact that you're not, um, getting like a day night differential, it's, it's very, it's very weird. And, and so like constant routine is simultaneously like very important for circadian research, but we shouldn't act as though, ah, this is the chance to see totally um, unconstrained circadian rhythms. Like you're always subject to some masking influence. And I think the, the biggest thing for me is that you just, you aren't gonna have somebody do constant routine before deciding when to give them chemo, for instance. So it's not practical or real time. Um, another solution is dim light melatonin onset or DILMO. And so this is the point um, where melatonin, your body naturally produces the hormone melatonin, um, starts to rise. It's gonna do that once a day. For day workers, it's usually gonna do that before bedtime, maybe two hours before bed. For shift workers, it can happen anywhere around the 24 hour clock. And you're just looking to see when it starts to go up. And so the advantages to this are that it's robust to most masking effects. That's great. Uh, and the problem is that you, you have to have a lot of samples to, to measure it. You can't be in the light because that will mask it. If you're, if you're in the light, that's going to suppress your melatonin. 
Um, in general, like it can take a long time to process these. And again, it's it's not practical in the real world. You're not going to have people doing Dilmo assessments, at least not the current incarnation of Dilmo assessments, every day. It's just not feasible. There are a ton of cool methods coming up. So uh, ways of tracking circadian rhythms using gene expression, pull out your hair and look at, at the gene expression inside that the cells in, in your scalp. Um, uh, have you swallow a pill so you can you can track your core potty temperature literally internally and the advantages to this are that it's faster than dilmo and cool and yet on the spectrum from invasive to non-invasive it's still more invasive than wearables which are non-invasive approaches for tracking to circadian rhythms and that's the space i live in okay so if you're trying to track circadian rhythms with wearables here is probably the first thing you're going to do you're going to say i'm going to use bedtime to predict dim light melatonin onset, which I will use as my gold standard biomarker of circadian phase. And what you might say is, hey, wearables can track sleep. I'm gonna find your average bedtime, your most recent bedtime. Use a formula like Dilmo equals bedtime minus two. Um, this is a totally natural thing to think. And for some populations, it's pretty good, but for shift workers, it's bad. Um, so shift workers can have their Dilmos at any time. So this is a rose plot. Um, from some of our old data, and the higher it is, the more Dilmos we had happening at that time. We have people coming in with 1 p.m. Dilmo or 7 a.m. Dilmo, and this is old data. Since since then, there's basically no bald spots on this plot. We've we've seen every Dilmo you can see, uh, and if you try to use bedtime to predict Dilmo, it's actually worse than random guessing. So this is a plot of the observed Dilmo, the true Dilmo, which you see runs the gamut. It's all over the 24 hour day. And then this proxy for Dilmo, which is you use sleep timing, um, either after their shift or during their shift, both are bad. Um, it, the, the agreement would be perfect if these dots were on the line, but the dots are not on the line. The dots are basically in a horizontal line. They're not at the slope uh, one line. Um, and the mean absolute error ends up being about seven hours, uh, which again, is really not good for predicting Dilmo. So bedtime for predicting Dilmo is pretty bad in the populations where it matters most. Uh, okay, next thing you might try is say, hey, those statistical models you were talking about, I wanna use those, so straight machine learning. So you can say, hey, I'm gonna take somebody's activity history or their lighting history. I'm gonna run it through a neural net. I'm gonna predict Dilmo um, based on some training data. And I think the problem here is the training sets are not huge. Like nobody has a hundred thousand melatonin samples and our inputs of when people are moving around, when they're, they're getting light, when they're sleeping are pretty high dimensional. So there's a lot of numbers um, that are coming in and not that many numbers that you can use to tune. Um, it's like you've got a keyboard with like 20,000 keys and you're you're trying to tune it so that it sounds in tune, but you've only got like, like one or two songs that you know how they should sound. Um, and so you're able to be like, oh, okay, I, I can maybe tune this part, but I can't tune the whole thing. And then you get a new piece of sheet music and you just play it and it's completely out of tune. Um, so other groups in our own have found that this just doesn't work for shift workers. Um, the plot here, once again, it's observed Dilmo on the horizontal axis, uh, model prediction of Dilmo. This is a statistical model prediction of Dilmo on the y-axis. The blue is like a machine learning crime. I trained on this data and then I tested on the same data, but I did that just to show how bad it is. Um, it's, it's tracking the line of slope one only in the middle and then out at the more extreme Dilmos, it just falls apart. It just cannot get those blue dots close to the diagonal line, which would be perfect agreement. Um, and then the red dots are the true evaluation. That's like, hey, this is test data. Can you predict the Dilma with this test data? And it's just random. It's just like all over the place. It's just like uh, somebody dropped a bunch of marbles. Um, so straight machine learning, as long as we don't have hundreds of thousands of melatonin samples, does not seem to be very good at predicting circadian phase. And so the next thing, that you can try. And the one that I think is actually quite good is mechanistic models or biologically informed mathematical modeling of circadian rhythms. And the basic idea is that you're going to process wearable data the same way the brain would. You're like digesting inputs to your system like your body does. 
And I just want to make the point, it's a little bit of a wonky one, but I'm not treating wearable data like an output of the clock. I think that's always going to have some issues with masking. So like, hey, my, my light looks like somebody in Korea. So my Dilma must happen around the same time as a person in Korea. Um, like it, I could just happen to have one day where I choose to live like a person in Seoul. But if I'm just doing this on this one day, my circadian state is not going to adjust in a single day. I'm going to basically look like somebody in Virginia who is weirdly trying to flip their day and night. So in this approach, we're actually treating wearable data like an input to the clock. So we're saying, hey, maybe today I chose to look like uh, I'm living in Korea. I started getting light at like 7 p.m. Um, and then stayed in the light for 16 hours and then was in the dark. Um, but before that, for four weeks, I looked like somebody living in Virginia, which is where I live. So then how much would each incremental little piece of light I got today phase shift me? Um, okay, I add up the net effect of all those little phase shifts to my circadian clock and I end up with my final phase. So a longer version of the basic idea is that we take some time series of the inputs, not outputs, inputs that are relevant to your circadian clock. Light is the dominant time giving cue, um, though activity also gives cues and light and activity are correlated. You don't usually work out in the dark. Um, and, and so we get this time giving cue history. We pass it through a model of your superchiasmatic nucleus, and then we extract predicted DILMO from that. Um, and this works way better um, than bedtime or pure machine learning. So our mean absolute error um, in that population where we had seven hours of error goes down to about one to 2.5 hours. And we've since um, done this, we presented this earlier this year at sleep with Apple Watch. So we're tracking people with Apple Watches uh, and we're getting down to a mean absolute error of about 1.77 hours between our predictions and the true phase. And you can just see these dots are much closer to the line, except for that one, like that, I always look at that one outlier and then I'm like, eh, that's biology. But we are, we are about four times more concordant using this approach than we are using sleep. Oh, and it's way better at outliers. So if you remember, a single outlier could really throw off a cosine fit, but biologically informed math modeling uh, is, is much more robust. It, it basically treats outliers as kind of bumps in the road where it, it, it jumps, it like it experiences a phase shift, but it doesn't wildly throw uh, its prior predictions away. It kind of processes an outlier the same way your brain would. So if I broke into your house and shined a light on you late at night, it wouldn't totally scatter your circadian clock. It'd probably shift you a little bit. And so I mentioned the Apple Watch. We've evaluated this approach using both research-grade devices and consumer wearables. Uh, pros of research wearables, tons of research on them. They often contain light sensors, but nobody just owns an Acta watch and they are pretty expensive. Oh yeah, and the Acta watch isn't gonna exist um, after this month. Uh, pros of consumer wearables, lots of people own them and you can sometimes get raw data. So you can get uh, raw acceleration, which I like even better than activity counts. Um, the cons though, they rarely have a light sensor. Um, though we found that light data might not be essential for tracking circadian phase uh, and people still might not have one. In fact, of course, not everybody has a wearable. Plenty of people have wearables and they just stop using them. But you don't have to wear a watch to get activity data. Your phone is functionally a wearable. So iPhones and many Android phones just track steps themselves. And so long as the user interacts with their phone over the course of the day, you actually can do quite a good job of getting Dilma just from that. And if they don't interact with their phone, we can use math to know. We can say, hey, the uncertainty is too high. We don't know when your Dilma is, so we're just not going to tell you anything. And if you run this kind of tracking on real world data, you get plots like these. And I love these plots. These are my most gossipy plots. Um, so this is an actogram. The horizontal axis is time of day plotted twice. So you have two days in each row. Um, the vertical axis is sort of days over time. So months, this is about four months of data for each of these people. The leftmost one is a college student. Um, and, and so the, the red line here is their daily predicted Dilmo, this marker of their circadian time. It starts late, it swings early, and then it goes back late again. Um, so this is sort of A over here. And this is a, a kid who was in college um, in 2020. Um, the first part is them on winter break. Then they go to class and they shift earlier. They probably have an 8 a.m. And then they start social distancing where that 
blue dash line is, and they immediately go late again. They immediately become more of a night owl. Um, so if you were teaching in uh, spring 2020 and people weren't showing up to your morning classes, here is validation. You weren't alone. Um, meanwhile, this middle person here is a parent. Their circadian rhythm's pretty darn consistent. You see a little bit of a wiggle um, back and forth, uh, probably due to the weekend. It's a it's about like a seven day period. And then the last person is a shift worker, and you see big swings in their predicted dilmo. And then you also see after they start social distancing, they just drift later and later and later. And it's possible they just weren't going outside as much, and they were were doing something called free running, where they they sort of resort to their um, fall back to their intrinsic phase, which for most people is like a little bit longer than a day. Um, so you, you might see this if I, I put you in a bunker, um, you wouldn't just have a perfect 24 hour day, you'd stay up a little bit later, or a little bit later, a little bit later, because you don't have a time giving cue to say, son, it's now day time to, to be awake. And so I just think this is so neat, because if you were trying to measure circadian rhythms, with expensive, time-consuming saliva tests. You just couldn't do it. You couldn't get 120 days on the same person. Um, but math can help us bridge the gap. And the kinds of questions you can ask of a mechanistic model like this are many. So how could uh, light phase shift individuals at different times of the day, given different psyche or time-giving cue histories for each person? Um, what would happen to my dilemma if I followed this schedule? What if I followed that schedule? Um, what if I take... Uh, melatonin at this time, given that I've recently done this trip um, and I need to stay up uh, uh, on this day to do a talk. You can ask these kinds of questions of mechanistic circadian models, and you can also use these models to make recommendations for people. So the last section here I'm going to talk through are some real world uh, interventions we've done using math to make the recommendations. Um, so one, is uh, called SYNC, and it was a digital health intervention for patients with cancer-related fatigue. Um, CRF can last for 10 years after treatment ends. Um, patients with CRF have not only lower activity amplitude, where I'm sort of like, yeah, okay, maybe that's circadian, maybe they're just tired, but they also have lower cortisol amplitude, and cortisol is a hormone that's under the control of the circadian clock, and the only recommended treatment is exercise. Um, so we designed an app to give people with CRF personalized circadian prescriptions um, using a mechanistic model. And the way to think about how we use a model is we can simulate a model. Uh, we can say, what would happen in this circumstance? But we don't have to do that once. We can do that over and over and over again. And we can say, okay, which of these simulations is the best for achieving some goal subject to some constraints? So your goal might be, hey, I want to adjust as fast as possible. And your constraint might be, hey, I want to spend time with my family. Um, I might want to uh, like not, for instance, stay in the dark in Hawaii for six hours in the morning. Um, and so you can say, okay, given that, here's the best thing for you to do. I want to show you a video of what it looks like when you try and adjust as fast as possible. So this is going to be a race between what people normally do when they are jet lagged and they cross time zones, which is slam shifting, which is sort of like, hey, I usually get up at seven. I'm going to get up at seven in my new time zone versus sort of an unintuitive adjust as fast as possible schedule that comes from simulating a bunch of times. Um, so it's red versus blue and they're trying to catch gray. So here is the race and they're off and red is still really out of sync with gray, whereas blue by day four, each hump is a day, it's pretty well entrained. And so math can help us arrive at schedules that we wouldn't find on our own that are a lot better for our goals. Um, so can simulate models a bunch of time to find the best intervention for a goal. And in the sync study, our goal was, hey, if you're not happy with when you're waking up, we're going to try and make you earlier or make you later, depending on which direction you want to go. But otherwise, we want to boost your circadian amplitude. We want to get you more uh, of this cortisol during the day. Um, so we gave uh, 64 people in our intervention group and our control group either a, the real app trying to do this intervention or, or a dummy app that just said, hey, put on clear glasses in the afternoon. Uh, and we we basically had them tell us every single day how fatigued they were. We give them a bunch of surveys every week. Um, the app looked like this, and it wasn't just an amplitude intervention. It was trying to shift them earlier or later if they weren't happy with their timing. But mostly we were saying, hey, 
it's the middle of the day to boost your circadian amplitude, get light now. Dose with light at this time. And this data is preliminary, but I think a very cool result is that we found that self-reported fatigue on a one to four scale um, was about twice um, that of the control group and our intervention group. And so the control group did get better. We think it's because we gave everybody a wearable, but the intervention group got twice as better. Um, and we also saw significant improvements in anxiety and sleep disturbance uh, uh, in our intervention group. Um, so with circadian interventions, I think there's not really a consensus uh, on what we mean by them. So I'm just going to do uh, 30 seconds on my soapbox and say, uh, we need a shared language for talking about circadian interventions. I kind of like calling it circadian synchronization therapy, which consists of the following four elements, personalized tracking of biological time, your circadian time. Uh, it can be a survey. It can be through wearables. It can be through Dilmo, whatever, but just some kind of personalization because everybody's got a different circadian clock and you on Monday could be different than you on Friday. Um, an explicit circadian goal. So waking up earlier, uh, boosting your circadian amplitude, and then targeted recommendations that both try to make you earlier or later, phase advance you or phase delay you, but also try and boost or squash your circadian rhythms if that's part of your goal too. Uh, and so this was our intervention, um, or this is our proposed intervention language. That was our intervention for people with cancer-related fatigue. Another group uh, that's really of interest to us is shift workers. And I just want to give you like a brief tour of the literature for what we might do with shift workers. So if somebody is a fixed night shift worker and they only work nights, you might try to move their rhythms later so their CBT min, their core body temperature minimum time, happens after their shift is over. So that's the time they're going to be most sleepy, like fallen over. Um, so we try and move CBT men outside of their shift hours. And this is an approach in the literature. It's helped people. Another approach is move them earlier, uh, shift their rhythms earlier so they can fall asleep before their shift. And um, this seems to work better for people who are older maybe, but again, it helped people in the study. But what about somebody who's on a rotating schedule or flipping from days to nights or somebody who only finds out they're working a shift the day before? Or what if you're fully phase shifted and you just want to maintain your current Phase. So we designed an app to give shift workers personalized circadian prescriptions. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, it used to be called Shift, the app for shift workers. Um, however, uh, somebody gave us a nice call out on how, how great it was. Um, and then if we look at one of the comments, somebody was like, hey, I can't find Shift on the app store because there's about 20,000 apps called Shift. Um, so we changed the name. To Arca shift, and we're really happy to be putting this out there and helping shift workers with mechanistic models in the real world do better than they would do without our insights. But let's bring it back to where we started. Why do we need mechanistic modeling? Okay, well, I would say a statistical model, a machine learning model is only going to know what it's seen before, and it can overfit to day worker Dilmo and struggle to fit the varied schedules of night shift workers because it doesn't know that I'm not going to shift 12 hours in a single day. It doesn't have any knowledge about the physics of biology. Um, why do we need statistical modeling? Well, I think a mechanistic model only knows what people have figured out and written down, and we really haven't figured out in the grand scheme of things all that much. So I don't have a formula going from brain state to heart rate or any of these things. And statistical modeling like, is kind of the language for that. So in the absence of me knowing exactly what's going on inside your body, a statistical model can express that just numerically. Um, so recapping, statistical model is kind of like a top-down approach. It can be really powerful and it can fit really messy data. Like images are wildly messy and yet we have cat classifiers and, and uh, hot dog or not, and like really powerful AI. Um, but they require lots of data, which is really hard to get with certain types of data. So there is no massive circadian biomarker data, uh, data set anywhere in the world. Uh, I'll say that they're not as hard as people pretend they are. A lot of people are just using out-of-the-box solutions for statistical models. Um, and I, I really think they should be as transparent and open as possible because you don't really know what's going on in many of them. They're sort of black boxes, um, which if you're using it to, to make yourself um, like look cuter with Instagram filters, I'm not so worried. But for health and medicine, I think it is important to be as open as possible. Um, meanwhile, mechanistic models are kind of like a bottom-up approach. So they're built by humans, which can introduce a preference for niceness that isn't really real. Um, but it also means that you can 
capture phenomena that a statistical model that's under trained, not enough training data can't. Um, they can be they can be kind of tough to work with because you're often homebrewing them from scratch. Um, and I, I'm a big believer in sharing code. Um, and, and I think the the future is combining these two. So remember that clock proxy I mentioned where um, where I made a prediction of the circadian clock and I was able to do better at distinguishing sleep versus wake in the, the work from this started in 2017. That's that pink curve. Um, so this includes the clock proxy. And remember that ROC curves are better when they look more like a stair step. And it kind of did the best of any of these. It was it was adding more information. So it's not surprising, but it's still, it's still interesting that we can take uh, motion and heart rate that we're passing into a statistical model, a classifier to get the probability for each chunk of time that you're asleep or awake. But you can also add a mechanistic model of your circadian clock into this classifier and it seems to do better. And so I think the future is hybrid models. Um, it's something that uses known properties of the brain to generate structural equations, tunes these parameters with incoming data, maybe even suggests new structural components in response to the things that we just haven't written down yet, persistent shortcomings of the model. So we can make mechanistic models inputs to our statistical models. We can use statistical models to tune and build mechanistic models. And I think this approach will bring us into the next era of using models for sleep and circadian rhythms. And with that, thank you so much for coming to my talk. I'd love to use the last 14 minutes or so to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Walsh. This was very great. And uh, I love the way you explain in a simpler way something that is very complicated. So thank you for that. Uh, I can see that we have about three questions in the in the chat. Um, so I'll start uh, with um, probably this one. So how much mechanistic models with incremental inputs solve the masking or overlapping factors problem? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the fact that we can get machine learning, or sorry, machine learning and sleep predictions with wearables of Dilmo in shift workers are about seven hours mean absolute error. And our approaches are 1.7 hours mean absolute error means that we're about like three to four times better. Um, and of course we want the error to be even lower, right? We wanna be able to exactly predict Dilmo, this, this circadian biomarker. But also, like, we can't get too accurate because then we're starting to, to sort of go below the, the actual resolution of the test. So with these melatonin assays, you usually have only 30 minutes um, uh, resolution. Like, here's a sample. Here's another sample 30 minutes later. And so I don't think we're going to get 15-minute accuracy. Um, and it's also something that is, it's not like oh, every melatonin curve is so perfect. Like often you see people who kind of bump and then go up again. We've seen people who have two clear peaks in a 24 hour period because biology is, is complicated. Uh, but I, I think like like the, the fact that we can do so much better, like three to four times better than you'll do with sleep timing means that mechanistic models um, are quite well suited to this problem space where we have pretty small data sets, but we have a lot of knowledge about how the SCN works. Do you think this would become even more complicated when you're not trying to only focus on circadian rhythms and when you're trying to just look at, you know, sleep in general and how different factors impact sleep? I would say that like sleep is maybe not the like best case for a mechanistic model um, purely in that we have some huge data sets, right? We've got some massive, massive data sets of, of sleep. And at that point, okay, I could add a mechanistic model for sleep that knows that it's really not likely that a person is in REM sleep for five hours, right? Like a statistical model doesn't know that. It, nothing's telling it, okay, don't let somebody be in REM sleep for, for five hours. I mean, it can, it can like learn that from its data, but it doesn't have any hard rule being like, that's not physiological. Um, and yet like the, the performance of sleep classifiers, it's not bad. Like they're, they're decent, like, especially for sleep versus wake. Um, so the value add of a mechanistic model there, I think is, is probably lower than in cases where we've got not huge data sets. 
Um, and the error when we try and use statistical models with those not huge data sets is quite high. Thank you. So I guess this is um, something related to that is, are hybrid models dynamic and always changing? I mean, a hybrid model is what you want it to be. Like, it's really like, it's a term I made up um, for this because I, I think like a lot of people are starting to go into the space, but there's no like fixed language on this is, this is what a hybrid model is. I'll say that like, certainly you can make models that are constantly changing. Like, and often uh, I think a lot of the statistical models that are out there in the real world are constantly changing. So um, like chat GPT is a great example. Uh, there's like GPT-3, there's GPT-4. It's, you can see that GPT-4 is changing as they as they give it new training data set. So, and it's giving you different outputs in response. Um, so a statistical model for sleep in, in like a wearable could be constantly changing. Um, they could be giving it new data constantly. And so you get one prediction one night, but if you ran the same data through the next night, it would still tell you something very different. And, and that's where we start to get into the question of, well, if you're just using this because you want to see your sleep, that's fine. But if you're running a research study or you're trying to see if an intervention is helping you, uh, it, it's kind of risky to have this black box algorithms that could be constantly changing because you might think you're getting better when really the algorithm just changed, right? You're like, oh, well, like I, I slept nine hours last night. But one way to make it look like somebody slept a lot more is just move your threshold for what you think is sleep versus wake. And if you make it a higher threshold to cross for wake, then you're gonna think the person is sleeping a lot better while their data is exactly the same. So it all comes down to the implementation details. Uh, and I think it's a really important conversation to have, like, like if you're gonna use a certain device for a certain use in the clinic or in research, do you know what it's doing? Because some models do change probably all the time. Yeah, and it's very important what you just said. Here we're talking about clinical implications and patients, right? So we really want to use something that we don't know what's doing, that changes all the time to, uh, you know, diagnose someone even, right? Or to uh, indicate future treatment. So ethical consequences to our choices as well. Definitely. Uh, I don't have any other, there is one other question, but I think you kind of answered that at the very end saying, how do you decide what type of model is more appropriate for your question? So would yeah, you say I, models? <laughs> I would say amount of data and like uh, how good a statistical model does just by itself. So like, like, like I said, sleep is a case where we do have a ton of PSG data out there and we don't have a ton of raw acceleration plus um, PSG uh, data, though I'm, I'm trying to build up a pretty big set. Um, but like, like if your statistical model is knocking it out of the park, you don't need to add a mechanistic component. But I think in cases where just naturally there's not that much data and or you really want to be able to project forward, you kind of want to, to play the video game of life in in sort of forward uh, motion and be like, what would happen if I if I got a pulse of bright light at 5 a.m. and then was in the dark for six hours after that? In that case, like a mechanistic model is great. Um, and there are mechanistic models of sleep that people built to understand the systems better. Um, but if your goal is just to tell somebody how, how well they slept last night, uh, it might be overkill to, to bring in like physics equations to answer that. And when we're, you know, there's lots of people that are trying to look at lifestyle factors and how they interact. And I guess this goes back to the masking problem, right? Like mm -hmm. if we're trying to account for circadian changes and caffeine use and alcohol use and medication and all of that, uh, do you think we'll ever get to a closer answer? I mean, that's what my company is trying to do. So very self-serving answer, but like the... Uh quote that I love most, my favorite quote is one that says like, hey, uh, biology is math's new physics, only better. And math is biology's new microscope, only better. And granted, that's like a very like math 
like pro math quote, but I, I think it's really true. Like there's so many techniques we developed to like put people in space and do wild physics things that we couldn't do to biology because it was too complicated. Like we didn't have the computing power to simulate your retina, to simulate your liver metabolism. Um, that's not true anymore. We kind of can do that. And armed with that, we can really start to say, here's going to be the effect of this food at this time in your body using all these different sensors and mechanistic models. And I think those are going to be cases where like true hybrid models emerge. We're using physics to, to say, this is what an esophagus does in these circumstances. This is what a front cortex does in these circumstances, but we're heavily, heavily infusing um, those models with data and using data to generate them so that suddenly all of these hidden quantities that like, I don't know why I feel this way right now. What's a mystery become seen. Like we really look inside our body with math. That's the vision. That's great. And, you know, gives us a lot of hope to put together people like you with math and physics expertise with people like me and others with, you know, uh, physiology expertise. So I think working together would be great to make the models better and better. I completely agree. Okay, so and with that, I think we don't have any other uh, questions in the chat. But uh, again, thank you so much for being with us today. This was excellent. And hopefully people listened and learned and the future will be brighter. I'm really happy to have had a chance to speak. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> thank you and have a good rest of your day. You too. Take care. Bye bye. Take care.